well. We're good? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're now going to start our last session. Um, and Shimon has been watching us um, over the last two days in parts. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, we're joined by art critic and curator Murtaza Vali. Hello? Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah, well, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he might interrupt me while I'm doing it, unknowingly. Okay. Um, it's too. So, Shimon is co-author um, of the Age of Earthquakes: A Guide to the Extreme Present, which with um, Douglas Copeland and Hans Ulrich Obrist. Um, some of these notions that are presented in that book. Um, on the extreme present and ideas around the self um, are also part of his um, presentation today, which is going to basically trigger the forms of thinking and ideas that Shimon has been working um, or around with certain collaborators um, across different formats. His edited books include um, Translated by Cities from Zero, The World of Madeleine Friesendorp, um, a fascinating um, artist um, who, I'm, no, who I, I'm going to ask, um, ask him about later. With, without, did someone say participate? And Hans Ulrich Obis interviews volume two. He is commissioner of the Global Art Forum in Dubai, um, which is an amazing site um, of sort of dispersal of certain um, very uh, compelling, also for, it's a very compelling form of gathering, um, which has also commissioned a lot of practitioners um, across the region. Um, so it happens every year um, in March um, around the Dubai Art Fair. Um, editor at large of Tank Magazine and contributing editor at Bidoon Magazine. Um, he is director of the Format Program at um, AA School London and a member of uh, uh, Fondation Prada's Thought Council in Milan um, and also the, the soon to be unveiled um, Art Jamil's um, Museum <coughs> Center. Uh, he's part of the Curatorial Council. Um, which they will be having their first exhibition for in November this year. Um, Shimon is also an extremely eloquent um, moderator, um, and so I'm uh, quite nervous to be the one who's sort of uh, his interlocutor today. Um, so yeah, hopefully we're going to hear him smoothly from Sharjah to Calcutta. Today. Great. Hi, uh, hi Calcutta. Hear me? I'm sorry, we're having some technical issues, as uh, always. As, uh, as I like to say, AI is easy, AP is an, always a uh, I'm going to start with a short prelude. Uh, I'm very sorry that I'm able to come here. I'm born in Bangladesh, never really lived there. Kakat plays a mythic role in cultural universe. Um, but for the most part, it's a universe that I'm alien to. I was looking forward to facing We have the I think just ask him to switch off the video. Do I know that, jo that they have... We have the I can't see. I think just ask him. It is a coarse scaffolding of prejudice and bias, which I'm sure everyone here and there has at some point experienced and will experience on a greater basis. As Timothy Garton Ash put it, we are living in a moment, quote, that is like 1989 in reverse, end quote. A time where, as Rana Dasgupta recently wrote here in The Guardian, many of us crave for anything other than the hateful technology of the nation state. For some, this expresses itself in the longing for lost empires. For others, they seek undiscovered forms of history beauty. And globalization, the system obsolete, and spasms of resurgent nationalism sign of irreversible decline. Nevertheless, having said that, as my prelude, I'm deeply grateful to Patty Priyanka, Experimenta, Natasha, 
Original this technological work very very much. So I am a final contribution to this year's curator program. I'm sure there's not much space in your minds left to absorb yet another presentation. What I feel I should really be doing is presenting something like uh, history of the distracted enemy. Uh, um, I won't uh, labor really the most uh, uh, incisive uh, expression of the contemporary moment uh, that uh, uh, a relevant to our city or capacity for and reflection. The distracted boyfriend meme because I hate to talk about what I've done. Um, it's a little bit like listening to my own voice on a recording or indeed on a feedback uh, on a speaker or uh, it's like scratching my nails on a black. Instead, I, I, I talk connection. This quote by the uh, of things I uh, was in, in the French French to me um, says the poet is he who beneath the name the expected differences rediscovers the buried kinships between things that scattered resemblances. Actually, this is the second part of. A quote paragraph where uh, I was actually comparing poet to the madman. Uh, 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 um, this in relation to a kind of field of signifiers um, and how the mad poet kind of engaged in these fields of signifiers. One destroys the, the, the chain connection, uh, the other, in a sense, discovers the chain. Although I've created exhibitions, I don't consider myself a curator. Insofar as being a curator means showing vigilance to what's at stake with contemporary curating via its histories, traditions. All of these things are exactly kind of topics that these last days. Instead, I want to invoke this term, which is contact. Our content has become one of the prime resources today as we move deep into a world shaped by data capitalism, a world that is maniacally connected and always on what Jonathan Crary referred to in this book 24-7 as, quote, the end of sleep. Right? So, of course, in a fully realized flat world, um, Sleep becomes the space of non-productivity. So, the kind of wishful for a pure, a pure, purely efficient flat world is that there is no sleep anymore. Um, and this is, you know, a very beautiful but extremely terrible uh, notion of transformation. Divorcement from our own circadian rhythms, the rhythms added to us by the moon, the sun. So, there's too much content. There's also dwindling degrees of attention. Knowing everything turns out to be slightly. Now, this kind of paradox, which is dictated by ubiquitous digital technology, was the content of our book, The Age of Earthquakes, A Guide 
to the extreme present, my co-author, Doug Glenn, and Andrew Cobra, and Wayne Daly. Forces driving the current world will only accelerate. Now, this project, this book, came out of a session at and 12, where I talked about the Andrew of Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan. The book of the media is the Matthew came out in 1967 and came to define the electric information age. McLuhan postulated that all media are, quote, extensions of man, and that the content of media, such as radio or television, isn't the radio program or the television program, but in fact the media itself. The content of television is television, the content of radio is radio, the content of magazine is magazine. Now, Tom McLuhan was an extremely uh, complex character, uh, and also a highly matter, and in a sense, his enigma, his enigma uh, is actually becoming more and more rich uh, as goes on. Uh, and in a sense, more and more relevant, I believe, to our contemporary moment. McLuhan was uh, James Joyce, PhD, on an Elizabethan pamphlet here called Thomas Smith. He was a great figure for the LSD generation, and yet he was also a devout Catholic. And he happened to have two daughters leading up to his mind, which is actually a biological condition normally only found in cats. McLuhan prophesied the internet, but he actually died in 19. As such, he never got to see the texture of our world today, where media and content and selfhood interchange at dizzying rates. Our book is an attempt to upgrade Marshall McLuhan to the 21st century, where Machines are increasingly talking about you behind your back. Technology often favors horrible people. So the Global Art Forum, which some of you certainly in this room will know, started in 2011 alongside Art Dubai, which is the largest global of art fairs in the Middle East. Since that moment, the forum has tried to take the cultural temperature of our current moment in time, and so far has invited 450 world's most compelling minds to think out loud. We're building up a growing map of knowledge and imagination, because every place in the world is also imaginary, and every in its own Uncover blind spots in the past which have been forgotten or erased in history. I've just picked out uh, a few examples here uh, in relation to this fascination of blind spots or erased moments in history. Uh, one of our editions is called Meanwhile, Dr. Dr. History. There was a fantastic paper given by uh, Masha Kirasirova, who teaches, who was teaching at NYU Abu Dhabi on Soviet Orientalism, where she reminded us that in Edward Said's uh, landmark book from 1978, Orientalism, the one Orientalism he apparently leaves out is Soviet Orientalism, so the specific relationship between the Russian Soviet uh, world and the Arab. The Arab. He had uh, a session by Michael Bankers, uh, for who's senior editor of the Dune, uh, which was called Extremely Soft Power or Trajectory of the Sudanese Gulf. So they're kind of back in the role of Sudanese protagonists, particularly in Qatar and uh, here in the UAE, either in the cultural industry or indeed in the urban planning um, department. Uh, and then there was a session with uh, Shuda from Rack. Um, Jocelyn Daklia uh, uh, and Justin Stearns looking at uh, Ibn Khaldun's uh, Mukadima uh, and how that might be, uh, again, newly relevant for our current moment 
of thinking about photography uh, and identity. So, forum, preferred content, to pure novelty, as such, there are always overlaps or echoes between the editions. Guests often come back, building up a collective memory. <clears throat> These are uh, previous. Uh, 2012, we looked at the medium of media. Again, uh, so somewhere between Marshall McLuhan, but also the Arab, the Arab, a year after the Arab Spring, so called Arab Spring. 2013, uh, language, uh, neologism. Um, uh, 2014, I just mentioned well, 2015, uh, um, um, uh, 2016, of the future, but seen from the past. 2017, on the trade, all kinds of goods, also a trade of ideas. So the shuttling of goods is always so a shuttling of ideas. Uh, and then this year, uh, I'm not a robot, uh, which looks at the perils and power of automation. So every, usually, from as you can the non-works, uh, every edition is co-directed with somebody new, somebody else that has a particular expertise on that theme. Uh, to me, this is very important because they bring a kind of world of insight, a world of fascination with them each time. And uh, and, and also, I think, uh, a new audience that enriches the, the, the global art forum each time. Uh, at the other end of the scale, details a lot um, is our stage set. Uh, every year we have these cushions made um, and they relate to the theme. Uh, and in a sense, they always ensure that even when the sofas are empty, there are still protagonists on the stage. Commissioning uh, writers and artists to produce essays, music, or art to be more impactive, such as here on the left, or a photographic study of Dubai's Dragon Mart by Farah Kassimi. And Dragon Mart is the largest uh, of Chinese manufactured, manufactured goods outside of China. It is just extremely um, beautiful kind of visual essay of these very strange interiors of Dragon Mart. We've also taken place in different countries, responding to context and audience. The next of these will happen in Singapore this coming September. Collaborate with the Art Science Museum here on in another chapter of Art and Not a Robot. Um, and so we're we'll looking at the status of automation, uh, moving, shifting the center of gravity to Southeast Asia, East Asia, um, uh, what the implications are there, uh, who are the key protagonists there on this theme? Um, these are the different descriptions uh, that I've heard used to describe the Global Forum, all of which I'm, uh, you know, more than happy to, uh, to, to, to entertain. A thought of ideas, pop up university, the most intelligent chat show in the world. Um, surely that's open, but who knows? Uh, and then the last one, the forum gives a deep background of the pen on all this, which I uh, like more than more than all of them. So I believe, I mean, again, I, I tend to not like to theorize too much about what we do, rather than uh, rather than actually just get on and do it. But uh, if I do have to say what it is that we try to do there, or that I try to do there. Um, it's a kind of staging of discourse, and in a sense, a live content machine. So, what it definitely isn't, the platform definitely isn't TED. Um, I don't think I need to explain to all of you what TED is, because uh, it's several use a testament to just how unbelievably successful and ubiquitous TED has become uh, as, uh, as a different kind of thing. Um, 
perhaps because it's the perfect crystalline format for the transmission of ideas today. His head turned into meticulously stage managed content with an obligation to be uplifting, humanistic, and entrepreneurial, which is exactly why I hate it. I have I've, I've conducted uh, very thorough scientific research, and I've calculated that uh, there are 62 people in the world who haven't done a test off yet. Uh, they're literally an extinct species. Um, the other thing, FYI, with Ted, I mean, the one thing that I think is really good and really important is that it applies to a very simple piece of neuroscience, uh, which is that attention really uh, maxed out at about 18 minutes. So anything after 18 minutes, you might as well not hear it. I'm probably in, already in that danger zone. I probably passed that danger zone now. Um, but if you look at the history of TED, and there's a difference in TED and TED, of course, but particularly TED, um, you'll notice that at the beginning, nothing really goes over 18 minutes. Mike is 20, but that's, that's it. I mean, this is very astute. Uh, and I think it's, it's one thing we, we should all learn uh, and kind of care uh, towards breath. Uh, and that, that the kind of marathon format be uh, often felt. Um, so that's, that's the one I will certainly give you that. Um, Okay, um, Samuel Beckett, uh, in writing about James Joyce's in progress, this was back in the early, quite a long time ago, in the early 30s, in the mid 30s. Um, so Joyce, James Joyce was, uh, he'd finished Ulysses a number of years ago, he was working on Finnegan's his way, uh, and uh, he didn't have time for work in progress, He'd given some of a draft over to Sam Beckett. Uh, and Beckett very incisively said uh, in one of his many different feedbacks is, uh, is that form is content and content is form. I mentioned this because uh, uh, as a way in to describe another, um, another staging of discourse, uh, the stage each summer. Uh, the Architectural Association in London, it's called Format. Uh, I've a live magazine, uh, shapes that this will take. And the most recent issue just ended, uh, literally uh, last week or the week before, perhaps. Uh, and the self format, so the consensus of the self, the individual of the self, to the condition of data capitalism, and you put it digital communication. Um, last year, and this was a kind of, this was a sequel, so a bit like the Global Art Forum, the different, the themes, um, the themes always uh, relate to the ones that happened before. This kind of ongoing research project. Last year, I was looking at power format um, and whether power is becoming more or less visible than it was before. I would argue less visible, right? Like, as basically as everything turns towards data, data is something we can't see, becoming more invisible, right? Um, and then if that's happening, where is power moving from and to? So, you know, Facebook proudly likes to remind us uh, population 2.2 billion is larger than any nation, any country on the planet. Uh, it's probably, you know, China uh, plus, plus the Americans, right? So this is kind of interesting in Canada uh, and this notion that what might come after the So are these kind of digital, are these like social media communities and a, a sort of possible form of statehood after the state? So this was power format last year. Uh, and then before that, I was looking at the couple format. Um, the couple format being the smallest unit of collaboration uh, and looking at the kind of power dynamics that bring people together, uh, which are often the things that also kind of force them to split apart later on.
Last May, David Lynch and Mark Frost brought back their legendary TV show, Twin Peaks, for the third season. It was 25 years since the last installment, and the same amount of time had passed in the story. Lynch described the series as, quote, an 18-hour-long movie, and arguably it has reinvented the television format as much as it did the first time around, but now for very different reasons. Those expecting easy nostalgia were disappointed. The new story splintered across different cities and even more realities. I'm not going to go into all the details, that would be very different talk to this one, but what I want to mention here is the texture of time that's encoded in this new Twin Peaks. In a character called Mike, our agent Cooper, is it future, is it past? Because it's not clear which comes first and which follows. So this woman here, some of you will recognize her, some of you may not. She's the actress, Catherine Coulson. She played a character called The Log Lady, which is one of the most beloved characters from the original uh, uh, of Twin Peaks. In the later episode, she makes a phone call to say that she has died. She's suffering from cancer. And indeed, she did during the first of the series. In fact, just a few days after this was filmed. So, did four other of the actors, not to mention David Bowie, who was also meant to appear afterwards. My own father died just a couple of weeks before Twin Peaks, the research began. The 18 actors accompanied me as he underwent surgery medication, and eventually recovery. In this season of Twin Peaks, the duration uh, is often determined by the real time. It takes for a cigarette to be smoked, right? So there's no cut. The scene is determined by how long it takes for Diane to smoke the cigarette. Or indeed, how long it takes for a floor to be swept, or the dirt in a bath. And then to someone just sweeping a floor for four minutes. It's weirdly radical. It's not so radical cinema, those of you who know the cinema of Ozu, which is a kind of reference to it as well. The beauty of the Twin Peaks was that it was impossible to guess which scene would lead to which scene. The logic is that dream. Also, the show is filled with flip phones and smartphones, Skype and letter writing. Every mode of communication seems to exist at once, bewildered by each other, the way the future is bewildered by the past. Because of what happened in my family, the texture of time changed for me as much as it did in the characters in the show. The mortality of time made a flat screen can transport you to otherworldly empathy. This is the office of Gordon Cole, uh, who's the head of the FBI on the right, who's played by David Lynch. Um, and you'll see in the background two extraordinary images that are facing each other. Here on the left, uh, from the famous mushroom cloud, the nuclear uh, atomic test, and on the right, the portrait of course of Franz Kafka. So lastly, in episode eight, the following happened, which may be the singularly most abstract piece of television content there's ever been. Can I make sure that we have the sound on from this speaker now, please? And if we can have the sound also on in Calcutta, that would be great. They cancel each other out even better. <laughs> Here we go.
that's the end. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, I the, the thing we were trying to pursue is that there's um, the question of automation. It's really weird feedback. Um, is usually met with either a kind of techno pessimism or uh, a sort of dread and fear. I think, and the, I think the reality is obviously somewhere in between. Um, the question that we will cyborgs is obviously redundant because we've been cyborgs for a very, very long time. Um, so, you know, we, in terms of artists, we had two sessions uh, with different uh, different artists like Katia Novakskova, uh, Anya Soliman, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, um, and uh, they, they're all dealing with the kind of question, but also the technology and the possibilities of automated technologies in very different way. Uh, obviously, Lawrence is dealing with it uh, from his kind of political forensic analysis. Katia is very much looking at uh, facial recognition technologies and how mapped onto non-humans, so animals. It's a very beautiful reference to the original Blade Runner uh, with, the, with the owl that's actually a robotic owl. So there's this notion in the future that there are never animals, right? So we have to kind of make robotic simulations of them. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, so Trevor Paglin, of course, has been very, very important. Uh, his essay, Invisible Images, I think is now Non-call and this idea, which I suggested uh, in relation to power, that there are more and more images being made today, but they're images made by machines. So they're images that are uh, post-tickle, that post um, even if we saw them, we wouldn't know what we're looking at anymore. Um, and uh, so Trevor's work uh, and his uh, now, as artist president of the AI Now Institute uh, in New York, uh, for me, it's like really, really important um, because I think one of the things that I, I would claim is that we need, you know, we need artists, we need writers, uh, we need filmmakers to tackle these things because if we leave them up to if we leave them up to the technologists, we know what their narrative is. Their narrative is all, always positive. It's always utopian. But in fact, in the age of earthquakes, it's the unintended, of, it's the unintended consequences of technology that make the future. Right? So it's precisely what you can't clap for that is what ends up creating the future. Uh, and now we're clearly living in that right now, right? Like the, the decimation of consensus reality, uh, the fact that, you know, a bot has physical purchase and maybe you or I, et cetera, et cetera. Technologists didn't plan this. It's not, I'm not saying reality that they'd hoped for, uh, uh, but it's precisely in all the blind spots uh, ends up being the future that we mostly inhabit. I think if, uh, and, and for me, uh, culture at its best uh, is able to see even the technology in a sense, like a, in a Duchamp way, which just you you look at it uh, for not how it was intended to be used. And it, through the misuse of it, you understand something about what we could call the technological unconscious. Um, okay, um, I'm going to now have a go at asking two questions. Um, and then in case Suga also wants to interject, um, that's also welcome. Um, so the first is, 
I wanted to get into um, also your writing and um, the way you worked with uh, also figures like Madeleine Friesendorp, um, who's such an exceptional figure, um, but has also sort of been marginalized. Uh, very few people know her as the, one of the co-founders of uh, OMA um, in the early 70s. And I wanted to um, just sort of think alongside you in terms of how um, you, you worked with figures like her. Um, and the second question is, um, once um, I, I recall you were reading, we, we met up and you were reading the book, Tell Them I Said No, by Martin Herbert. And we had this sort of conversation around also the problematics of the professionalized art world um, being sort of revolved on being present. Of course, here uh, we're missing your presence a lot. Uh, but uh, the, the, the question of, of being present and what that means, uh, the kind of pressures it puts on artists in particular, and how that can also be a question where um, the, um, the, the, the professionalization is perhaps uh, not as conducive for artists as it is um, for curators, so the importance of saying no, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe I'll ask this. Turn on those backwards. Uh, I think. Obviously, yeah, Martin Herbert sort of postulates the notion that. Uh, you know, one of the logic uh, of pressures, certainly of a kind of neoliberalized uh, art market, constant presence. And of course, constant presence in would include like constant social media presence, um, constantly appearing on eFlux, uh, constantly being seen at the right openings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as we know, uh, you know, visibility is of obviously uh, a very key mechanism, you know, through which uh, power and influence kind of lubricates itself. But uh, I think we, in a, maybe in a sense, those figures that somehow choose to bypass that. Um, and here I'm thinking of everyone, Brady Salinger, to some extent on DeLillo, uh, Elena Ferrante, of course, um, I've been listening to a good, great documentary on Nick Drake, um, famously only gave an interview in his whole life. Um, you know, there's uh, something obviously old fashioned about that, like basically saying uh, it's my work that matters and not me. Um, and of course, you know, I happily admit that in many cases, me is the work, right? So I'm not discounting formative practices, uh, dressing up in a certain way and appearing in a certain way is, is what, you know, is what you do. But um, I coined, I coined a, a, a acronym a few years ago called JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. Uh, that, that was like my sequel to FOMO, um, because of course, like FOMO is, you know, FOMO, FOMO is exacerbated by this kind of constant Thing. The fact that we're, we're made to look at people elsewhere having the time than we're having, that then induces, is, induces a certain anxiety. But I actually think that there's a real joy in, in sort of uh, reveling in the fact that we're not somewhere. And so, you know, I think apply JOMO to, you know, your practice, whatever you do, uh, and, you know, make... Uh, Talib choices, I guess. I, I, I think I think when you're when you're young, you say yes to everything, and there's a reason for that, because you know you don't know if this opportunity is going to come around again. But I think you know one of the hopefully one of the privileges of getting older and maybe becoming more successful or something is just being able to 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 decide, right? Um, and there's something about the kind of por pornography of presence. Uh, that you know, I mean, it's it's the standard, it's the default condition today. But I think those who choose to uh, take some distance towards that, uh, uh, and in a sense reassert what what really matters, 
um, you know, something I, I, I not only respect, but I can kind of sympathize with. Um, does that answer that question, Natasha? Yes. Hold on, hold on. Uh, okay. Do you want me to answer the question? Murtaza is walking over. He's walking over. I think you talked him to him. Natasha, you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I was actually uh, struck by a couple of history <laughs> having this conversation, but I was a little struck by the um, the two phrases staging of discourse and live content machine. Uh, and then also your image of, uh, of Kanye and Greta with strike through, strike through it. Uh, because I'm, I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering about is what makes this course uh, saving, but it's not worth saving. And I guess what it's a kind of a, a long-winded way of asking in between a uh, quick question about uh, the distinction between uh, objecthood and enlightenment in our contemporary moment. Sorry to ask, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. So I basically was, uh, I'm, because the uh, type of, uh, of curating, um, like what being curated has come up a couple of times over the last couple of days, um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, about basically what the difference is between curating objects and curating live, uh, liveness or, or discourse, and whether uh, objects are inherently uh, easily fetishizable and hence easily reducible and easily consumable, while somehow discourse, the staging of discourse resists that. Because my, uh, my take is that in this, in this moment of kind of like a data generation uh, content, regardless of whether it's live or static, uh, is capitalized. And so I'm just, I, I guess the people who engage in liveness, whether it be performance or whether it be in stagings of discourse, uh, just to push them a little bit about uh, thinking through this. This is kind of like anxiety around sick because it's considered to be sick while uh, kind of like a uh, an embrace of liveness because it, it's inherently not uh, contained or discreet in a, in a spatial temporal sense. Okay, I'll try and answer that. Uh, the strike through was uh, not universal. It was specific to me. Um, I think, I mean, I just don't, I was interested in being a curator maybe 15 years ago and less interested today, uh, but that in no means is a critique on the whole like process of curating. I mean, it's uh, in relation to my own practice. I, I think if I, if I have a discipline, it's my, uh, I probably spend my, most of my time not writing, which is, you know, the fate of probably every writer trying to write. Um, but um, I think, uh, no, I'm not making a value judgment uh, per se. Uh, it, again, it's just in relation to myself. Uh, I'm more than happy to go and see objects in galleries. Um, but I know what you're saying, that there's obviously been... Uh, I mean, let's look at the music industry, right? The music industry has been completely decimated by, uh, I mean, first by the digitization of MP3, uh, then you know, now somewhere between YouTube and Spotify, all these different things. Uh, you know, musicians simply, it's almost impossible to make money selling records or selling your music. The only way to make music uh, any living or make capitalized by creating the unique live event, right? So uh, the gig is like the, the last uh, salvageable way of capitalizing our music today. You know, it's like, um, again, it's great. Like, he was like painfully, uh, pathologically shy, didn't, um, couldn't play in front of an audience. Uh, you know, he literally would make like the only way to make money is the, the kind of liveness of experience. And I totally agree with you. I'm not, you know, and, and there's a way in which this is, of course, commodified. Um, and we've seen that also now in, you know, within our practices. 
uh, whether it's the you know a return to or someone like a Lewis and the occasion relates to, uh, somewhat to Tina Degas and and this, this kind of you know and I and I think there are of course uh, you know a, a attempts uh, strategies. I know. I mean, Isabel Lewis was was one of the artists I invited this time to uh, the Global Art Forum, and you know, we we just play. You know, again, perceptions of time, of intimacy, how it's transforming through this thing that I'm holding here in my right hand, um, and of course, uh, creating a very highly uh, sort of intimate space of body, right? Mel, for example. So I just spent time with Sissel Tola, and we will know. And uh, there's a, a sort of this research expert on smell. Think about it. Smell is the one thing that still yet, and maybe, and she would argue, will never be captured in the digital, right? So, so I, I mean, I'm certainly interested in I'm interested in things that can't be captured. And interesting things that can't be captured by a picture, uh, by a camera, that can then be relayed uh, effortlessly, right, to all of us, and somehow that stands in for a so-called quote-unquote experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked with Pamela Rosenkrantz at the Fondazione Prada last year, um, and one of the key elements was creating a kind of fragrance. Uh, and this was very important because the fragrance can't be captured uh, on camera. Uh, it can't be captured on the website. It's something you had to go and experience. Uh, and specifically, it was made from a specific kind of uh, top, uh, uh, pheromone that only 30% 30, 30 of people in the world have. So you have a violent reaction against it or you love it. Uh, and it's actually used in Chanel Number no. 5 and CK1. So this was a really important part of, uh, of the production of this project. Um, so yes, I mean, it, to some extent, I mean, it's not something, I mean, sometimes it's conscious, but uh, it is certainly unconscious that, you know, what are these can't be captured uh, by the camera. Uh, last thing I would add here is that I find myself, I was at LACMA a couple of years ago, incredible comprehensive exhibition on exceptionalism. You know, Bang Van Gogh and so that. I literally found myself moving through a pace I would swipe on Google pages. It was exactly the same rate. And at that point, I realized that that mode of perception, that mode of content consumption, had, you know, gone from the screen into my body. And this wasn't necessarily because. You know, there was like there were degrees of detail and texture, right, in these paintings that was absolutely extraordinary that I'd never seen before. But I was just registering them as JPEG or GIF, and I was moving through them at that speed, you know. And so again, this is an unintended consequence of technology, right? And and yeah, I'm I'm sort of interested again in things that are that codifying. Mm -hmm. We can take questions from the audience now, but we have very little time, so we'll possibly take one or two and then move into the panel discussion. And so if somebody wants to ask anything, they sort of actually have to go or, or towards I can, Priyanka, or, um, I can, or she's going to repeat it. If it's it. a long question. That's also fine, yeah. Um, are there any questions? There might be some questions here. Yes, <laughs> there are. If there are any questions in Sharjah in the audience? Hold on. I'm sure Umar wants to ask something. No. Well, I have another question too. Okay, what are the uh, Umar's being shot? Um, so my other question for you is uh, global art forum. I've never had the opportunity to experience format. But uh, the Global Art Forum happens within a very specific context. Uh, so both a cultural context and then also uh, an art world or institution context. And so uh, what, I, what I guess I was I, I to ask you is how you approach um, or how you think about that context when you program the event. 
the co- and I and I and I've seen a lot of the global art forms. So I kind of know this answer, but I I kind of wanted to ask you, like, get some insight into your brain uh, as to produce uh, uh, content that makes sense within the local cultural context. How the context of the art market that surrounds the global art form tent, how that affects what you think others are, who you invite, who you ask them to uh, engage with the idea. Uh, I that we're in an art fair, um, not of prime concern to me, and I've been given the power and privilege to do so, which is quite extraordinary, right? Like. Um, and in a sense, uh, but I think that did relate to the broader context. Uh, and so, you know, certainly when I got involved, you know, maybe 10 years ago, this kind of event was not something that existed here uh, at the UAE. Uh, um, and, and, you know, I think like many protagonists, whether they're people that set up galleries like Ilma or, or Sunny and Claudia or whether they're people that set up movie nights or, you know, they're addressing, uh, I think, a particular land, cultural landscape where some things have not happened in a certain way. And that's very exciting because it, it gives you the opportunity to, uh, to, to bring something new. And I think uh, certainly 10 years ago, eight years ago, nine years ago, I think, I hope what the Global Art Forum is bringing, which uh, is a sort of, you know, a series of debates and discussions that cut across disciplines. I mean, it's as simple as that, right? So, and it's as simple as saying, you know, for us to really understand like art, we have to understand everything else as a context and vice versa. So, um, so, you know, at that point, I think there was, uh, there was, there was a, a very interesting kind of landscape where we could introduce these formats and for it to find new audiences. Um, and I think thereon we have followed two kind of logics. One is to maintain that kind of polydisciplinary um, kind of like fascination. Uh, of which art is not given any priority. It's just one amongst many. Um, and if anything, sometimes, you know, I would actively play it down. Uh, and then the other is the question of geography of where we are. And so, you know, one of the sessions we had a few years ago was called MENA. You might think that Middle East, North Africa, we actually decided it was Middle East nervous anxiety because you know, we, when people talk about the region, you never really know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, and I'm sure this is, you know, true of South, South Asia as well, right? So are you talking about, you know, the Emirates? Are you talking about the nation states, the Gulf, the Middle East, North Africa, the Arab world? Ah, you know, like constant. And, and without a doubt, there'll be someone in the audience that will call you up on it, you know. So... Um, but in, instead of seeing that as an anxiety, I think you see it as a, it's actually a really interesting, productive, not to start thinking through questions of geography. Uh, so that's why I mentioned the Soviet Orientalism one. I mean, it's really one of my favorite sessions because, you know, suddenly to think about the Arab world, but from the Soviet perspective, like changes everything, right? So, um, so that's the other thing that I think we've, we've tried to pay attention to, that there's content that have direct relevance an audience that is from here, um, but then we'll have indirect relevance to everyone beyond and vice versa, right? So it, it's, it's um, it, I think both of, both of these axes are actually kind of Catholic, uh, which to suggest, you know, it's always part of a kind of multiplicity. Uh, and instead of having anxiety about that, you kind of ha- harness that as a productive force, I think. Okay. We'll continue. Thank you. <clears throat> we will uh, we will continue in ten minutes from now. We will all regroup and and maybe you can continue on the Skype. Just take a ten minute break, maybe, and then we uh, we start the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. The group discussion. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.
we'll take a <laughs> we'll take a 10 minute uh, break.